It's the first joint webinar of uh, EBIS uh, and uh, GLO, and uh, fortunately, I can manage uh, both very well because I'm the president of both organizations. Uh, so with the strong uh, support of uh, Mehmet Gilgen, um, the vice president, we have uh, today this uh, lecture at an important time, at an important issue. I'm very happy to welcome again David Audrich, an old friend, um, uh, we have met uh, over decades, a few times uh, around the globe. Um, now he is at the moment, and for quite a while, a distinguished professor, uh, and has the Ari uh, Ameritech Chair of Economic Development. He is also the director of the Institute for Development Strategies at the School of Public and Environmental Affairs. And you all know him very well as uh, the editor of Small Business Economics. So nobody better to talk um, at this time about democracy and uh, COVID and entrepreneurship. And David, please uh, go ahead. I'm very curious to hear you. Well, uh, well, thank you very much, Klaus, for that very kind introduction. And yeah, it's really true. Klaus and I go back. Uh, decades and decades and decades way into the, the depths of last century. And he and I remember when we were young before either of us had children. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's amazing how time changes and situations change. So I, I really appreciate your, your, your kind introduction, Klaus. Uh, I also appreciate the kind invitation from, from Mehmet, uh, uh, who now is a, is a more recent friend I think we met uh, uh, two years ago or so, right, with Klaus in Coventry. Um, but um, uh, I appreciate the, the invitations from the EBS and from the Global Labor Organization, the GLO. Uh, 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 and it is fortuitous that Klaus is president of both. And I'm honored to be the, uh, the, the, the uh, kickoff speaker of these, uh, of these uh, online webinars. And you know what they say, uh, 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 challenges can come, but nothing can slow down EBS and GLO. At least that's what they, they should say. So let me try to share my screen and see what this looks like. Let's see. And then hit the, whoops. And I'll start at the beginning. Yeah, as, as uh, uh, Mehmet said, Klaus said, the, the, the topic of my talk today is about, um, it's about democracy and entrepreneurship and the threat posed uh, by the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. And just to make sure, Klaus, how much time are you giving me? Four hours, right? Yes. <laughs> I will interrupt you after four hours, yes. Uh, uh, roughly about okay, how much well, time? I mean, yeah, take, take, we have an hour in total, but uh, not more than 40 minutes. Uh, so right. hour, 30, minutes. 30, 40 minutes. Okay, good. I just wanted to uh, uh, make sure with the different time zones and calculations. Uh, anyway, when I think back to when I met, uh, uh, when I think back to when I met Klaus, which was right before the Berlin Wall fell, and then we would meet up, uh, 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 We'd meet up, uh, 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 you know, during that time with the the with the Germans called Die Wende, the, when the wall fell, and uh, those are fantastic days, right, Klaus? And nobody ever would have thought that democracy would be challenged or questioned. In fact, Klaus, if we we remember back, there was a famous best-selling book um, by uh, the political science Francis Fukuyama. I remember they made a big deal about his book in Germany. I mean, I think they did all around the world called um, The End of History. And that book must have come out in 1991, right? And Fukuyama's point was that um, somehow with the fall of the wall, the collapse of communism, Eastern Central Europe, uh, uh, the West had won. And what that meant was democracy had won. Uh, 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 capitalism had won over totalitarianism and over, um, over uh, uh, a command economy. And so this great tension 
that had existed for decades uh, uh, had come to an end, which Fukuyama uh, uh, characterized as the end of history. And I'm sure Klaus probably meant it too, remembers back then. And it seemed, you know, the only criticism you could see, think of a Fukuyama is that, well, that seemed obvious uh, with the celebrations and the end. So it's kind of um, uh, uh, striking now to read headlines like this. This is a, a title page of The Economist. Is democracy in danger? Threats to democracy around the world have become increasingly obvious. And, you know, of course, with the elections here in the US and um, uh, all of the um, ambiguity, complications that have arisen since the actual vote. I mean, when I was young, uh, when I met Klaus and before, used to be we vote on election day and there'd be a result on election day. And now somehow there may be a result, but it's somehow people are, or, I mean, pe many people are wondering, is democracy somehow damaged? And, uh, but in fact, this headline came, uh, came before uh, certainly the election and even came before, uh, 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 before the, um, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, because of course the COVID pandemic we observe has, uh, has, has fueled uh, 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 maybe not anti-democratic uh, tendencies, but certainly has fueled the authority of governments and the authority of decision-making to uh, impose on freedoms and what are perceived as, as being anti-democratic. But this headline came out actually, I don't know, two, three, four years ago. and wasn't referring to any particular country. Uh, you can see in the, 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 uh, the Untertitel down there at the bottom, the sub the threats to, to democracy around the world have been increasingly obvious. And at the same time, uh, uh, there have been, uh, which I, I don't think is really known that well, that um, uh, over the last um, uh, maybe, maybe 20 years or so, uh, entrepreneurship measured in various ways and under different kinds of, has also been declining uh, as well. And so in terms of, um, in terms of um, uh, uh, democracy, uh, uh, there's a, uh, uh, an organization called Freedom House that has been around since the end of World War II. And they've measured a democracy every year, not perfectly. Uh, and they've, they've identified there's been a decline in democracy since 2006. So almost for about 20 years. In 2019, 64 countries, and I'll explain what this means in a minute, exhibited uh, declines in democracy since 2006. So this isn't about any one country or any one institutional context. It seems to be a broader sense. Um, and then we've seen, which I'll explain in the paper, and it's not our measurement at all, uh, but rather uh, it's, it's, it's uh, a body of researchers have been measuring a decline of entrepreneurship in various ways, not in one country, but really throughout the OECD or the developed countries. So my, uh, my colleague, Petra Moog of the University of Zegan and I, we've written a paper trying to, uh, uh, certainly not trying to test this, that's way premature, but really what we're observing is uh, a tendency, it seems like where uh, democracy is in retreat, entrepreneurship is also, uh, has been under de uh, retreat or it's declining in some way. And uh, what, what we do in the paper is we look at four different, you could say contexts, but you could say examples. I like context better. And two of them are historical and then two of them are contemporary. The two historical ones is we look at national socialism in Germany and we look what happened to democracy and entrepreneurship. Uh, we look at the, um, the, um, the populist movement in the United States not what we call populism today, but the original population, populist movement in the late 1800s from roughly 1870 to 1890. And then we look at the contemporary um, uh, uh, economies, uh, what's happening with democracy and, and, and entrepreneurship. And then in the special context of what's, how does this look under the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Why does this matter? Well, really, 
as we see this decline in entrepreneurship, not just in one country, but really across many developed countries, it's hard to find exceptions now. Does this really foresee a greater uh, a threat to democracy? Is there somehow a link? Uh, there may be implications for policy. And in particular, when people have thought about entrepreneurship policies, they've typically thought of, oh, it's good for innovation, it's good for growth, it's good for jobs. But this might actually suggest something even more fundamental. It's a, it's a, it's a cornerstone of democracy. It looks like, it seems like, the threat to democracy and entrepreneurship has only been exasperated in the COVID-19 pandemic. So it turns out there's a whole field, I mean, I didn't really know this, of studying uh, democracy. Uh, 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 you could say it's a, it's a subfield or it's a line of research. And this has been around for a long time. And with this is measurement and the way that this field uh, measures democracy. Now this is from Freedom House and um, uh, we're just really consumers of it, is they measure uh, elections, ethnic cleansing, safety of expatriates, rights of immigrants, freedom of expression, term limits for executives, political executives, and um, uh, in, so, in some other, other uh, things too. What we can see is that since um, about 15 years, these various measures have been declining. Now that's for all the countries that they, they measure, which is many. They measure particular countries. So we created graphs like this, certainly not for every country. Uh, we'll leave that to the younger econometricians to kind of actually test for causality. But we can see, this is just an example, but we can see for many countries, um, this is one country we just picked out for, uh, I think there's probably a particular reason because it's been in the news a lot uh, before COVID and before um, the elections in the US and before Brexit even. And we can see the green line is this index of, of, of democracy. And we can see that's gone down over time. And then we can see the measure of entrepreneurship which is new businesses has been going down. So that's kind of an example of, we're seeing a correlation uh, in the contemporary world in many e economies, that's for sure. We also see um, a perception, you know, forget isn't, is this true? Isn't this true? Is there, but Klaus would remember back when the, you know, not just when the Berlin Wall fell, but in the nineties, we didn't see any kind of articles or, I, we somebody could do a search uh, for democracy in articles. It wasn't perceived to be under attack uh, in really almost any of the Western countries, developed countries, let alone in a plethora in a lot of countries. So that's just another example. Um, so what what the um, going back to the measure here um, of, of uh, what the Freedom House finds is that, as I said, there's 64 countries between 2006 and now have exhibited a decline of democracy like we see for this country. Uh, the United States, for example, back then was uh, measured as having the fourth strongest democracy. So on this ranking, it ranked only behind Germany, Switzerland, and Estonia. And now the US has dropped considerably and is ranked behind Greece and Slovakia. I mean, I wouldn't take that as, uh, there's other indicators, the Economist Intelligence Unit They've been measuring and tracking democracy since 1946. They find the same trends. Um, we didn't really do a correlation. That's not really what we're trying to do. We're trying to do is, is in the paper, but I'll, you know, my talk is to think, to suggest that, that there may be a link and a, an important, a reason why entrepreneurship may be important other than what we've thought about in the past for innovation, for growth, productivity, those things are important, but it may be important for uh, for democracy. The Peace Research Institute of Oslo, not so well known, they've also had me measurement for years and they've identified a clear decline uh, in, in recent years. Um, so there seems to be this pervasive uh, decline. So then what we do or what I wanna do today is just talk about these, uh, these different contexts, two of them historical, and then talk about more contemporary times and the first context is, goes back in under National Socialism, actually before National Socialism, if you go to the Weimar Republic, 
uh, what we can see was that the, there was a policy of legalized cartels from, uh, there were not very many in 1900, by uh, 1925, there were 2,500 uh, legalized cartels. As National Socialism uh, uh, came into office, this, 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 this uh, uh, just continued and seemed to play a big role for the uh, control of society. I mean, most people, I think, uh, uh, conclude or assume that the first thing that Hitler did when he uh, took power was to burn the books and persecute the Jewish people and other, other people. Uh, that came later. Actually, one of the first things he did was to suppress uh, the autonomy, independence of small business, the ability to start a business after he was elected um, to, uh, 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 in the early. So there was a series of, uh, and in the paper, we kind of go through this. There's a series of, um, of, of, of principles uh, uh, which uh, the, uh, were to, um, were to um, uh, suppress autonomous thinking and independence of thinking and to uh, uh, force or to try to propagate uh, conformity uh, 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 among people and among the population. And a key instrument of this was uh, actually um, uh, uh, a series of policies. I mean, nobody calls them anti-entrepreneurship policies or call it, but when we look at them, we think, okay, these were, these were laws to shut down small business or shut down small business that was uh, deviating from the national socialist uh, agenda. And starting in 1933, there was a series of laws. And then we can see in uh, 1933 is this uh, uh, legal or the, 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 the cartel cartelization was imposed on industry after industry after industry. And so what we could see or what we can measure in um, my, my co-author Petra arranged uh, for this data from, um, uh, 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 we can see these are new startups, new firms being started in Germany. And you know, it has its ups and downs and, but we can see in 1933, um, it starts to fall and continues to fall throughout the era of national socialism. Once that's over, it pops back up again. So it's clear that the um, uh, part of the, and, and of course, we're not going to try to impress anybody that democracy was in, suppressed in National Socialism. Uh, uh, that I think is, is, uh, is, is a given. So, you know, the causality, which comes first, we don't want to argue necessarily, but we know that along with the suppression of democracy also came a suppression of independence of thinking, autonomy, and that meant uh, 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 a shifting away from autonomous small businesses, independent businesses to cartelized industry. It's just easier for authoritarian regimes to do that. So that's our first context. And it's really just an observation to say, yeah, we're seeing in today's world a decline in, it seems like democracy and various measures of entrepreneurship. We saw it in this episode as well, this, this context, this, this uh, uh, context. And um, there've been a lot of, um, I'm not gonna go through these a lot of, we're just looking at what the historians say as they observed uh, the concentration of decision-making and the conformity of decision-making. Um, and and um, uh, one Hans Mumsen, a, a historian says, we're really no longer entrepreneurs anymore, only managers he's observing from this period and so on. Well, the second context we look at is what's called the populist movement in the US. And of course, this is interesting because for no other reason, <clears throat> we see all the time now reference to um, the, uh, the, the contemporary populist movements all around the world, including in, in the United States in the last election. Uh, the populism seemed to have fueled uh, the election uh, to some degree, and then four years ago as well. Uh, but th these are the new contemporary, the, I don't know if this was the original populist movement, but it was in the United States. 
And that happened in, um, started in 1870. But before that, 50 years before, a Frenchman, Alexis de Tocqueville, he went to, he, he sailed to the United States to try to learn about the experiment of democracy uh, uh, in, in, in looking for, and he wrote this famous book, Democracy in America in 1835. And in searching for the roots of democracy, he found his answer in small business. He has this famous quote here, what most astonishes me in the United States is not so much the marvelous grandeur of some undertakings as the innumerable multitude of small ones. It was the plethora of small independent business he felt was the cornerstone of democracy. Why is that? Because it affords diversity of thought, different thinking. It, has, it separates people's economic dependency or from their, their um, political values. And it was an observation. That's what seemed to exist and seemed to characterize the country until um, after the Civil War in the United States, uh, 1860 to 1865. That's a political cartoon from the time. And uh, oh yeah, I, I never even noticed till just now the uh, the, the man, uh, uh, the, I guess the, the uh, controlling everything, controlling the money and, and controlling people. You can see it's 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 Rockefeller, and of course Rockefeller was the uh, uh, yeah he was an entrepreneur actually, but he was the uh, person who created the great. They called them trusts at the time. We would call them monopolies in the railroads in the oil, in industry after industry, meat packing. Um, uh, and what this meant for the population, um, especially in the Midwest, where there were small farms and small towns that were had been previously isolated. There were small businesses, perhaps doing um, uh, small manufacturing. They could no longer compete against the more efficient, uh, larger, we call them corporations now, then they called them trusts. And we had this total um, change in life or kind of the way of life. Uh, 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 people were driven off the land, they were driven off their farms, they were driven off their small businesses. They could no longer uh, 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 survive. They couldn't be uh, viable uh, in those small businesses and farms. And so they gravitate to the cities where they'd end up working in the in the Chicago in the meat packing industry, or in Cleveland in the oil refineries, or in Pittsburgh in the steel industry, as that was as that was growing, and uh, this propagated a lot of misery. People perceived a loss of uh, power, a loss of autonomy, a loss of a voice of say of their own outcomes, and the response was. A political response, which we call the populist movement, it ended up uh, re uh, uh, shaping political parties and elections. Now, I don't want to argue who was right or who was wrong, but I I want to just observe what the historians re re uh, observe, which was um, uh, the the uh, there was a loss of local markets being uh, subsumed by national geographic markets. There was a wave of technological change that made these, these large dominant corporations possible, like in steel, like in oil, and so on. And that displaced the small local businesses, also including the agriculture. Um, um, and the, yeah, the political response was this populist movement. The response then of the, the institutional or the policy response was to uh, intervene into the freedom of firms to contract. And so the United States saw the enactment and regulation of competition policies, uh, what, what we would call competition policies, they called them antitrust to, to break up the trusts, um, uh, uh, that culminated with the Sherman Act of 1870. So the point really is that there was this perceived, I mean, one thing we know, there was a loss of small business for sure. It was a loss of autonomy, a loss of control over people's lives. Was there really a loss of democracy at that point? There was a perceived threat of, of democracy in any case. 
and the response seemed to be really pivotal, fundamental changes in institutions like the Interstate Commerce Act, uh, the Sherman Act, a whole series of uh, the, the whole idea of separation of commerce or business from the government that, that ended right there. In a famous plea to Congress to, to enact his law, his antitrust law, the Senator John Sherman in 1890, he pleaded, if we will not endure a king as a political power, we should not endure a king over production, transportation, and sale of the necessities of life. So there's this sense that says, we don't want to lose autonomy, decision-making of in our own life, just like we don't want to lose autonomy in the freedom to make decisions in a political sense, which, you know, in the paper, we, we go into more, you know, what does that mean, democracy? Uh, but you, you can see that John Sherman right there is somehow, and then Congress, when they enact the antitrust laws, they're equating uh, uh, that to have democracy, we also need, uh, you could call it economic, um, economic autonomy or economic um, um, uh, uh, small scale dif diffused decision making over many units not concentrated into one unit. But of course, what happened in the subsequent years, despite this kind of regulation, uh, uh, nobody measured things like small business or, but this is one study from the early 1900s to the mid 60s. And we can see that march towards concentration continued and we can see the decline of small business continued. This was thought enough or, or uh, the, the thought leaders like, like Joseph Schumpeter um, who said famously, what we have to accept is that the large scale establishment has come to be the most powerful engine of progress. He, and of course he's the father of entrepreneurship, but by the 1950s, he saw it differently couldn't beat the efficiency of large. And this is what drives economy and society. Now there's policy implications. John Kenneth Galbraith, a thought leader at the time and president of the American Econ Economic Association came to the same conclusion. There is no more pleasant fiction than that technological change is the product of the matchless ingenuity of the small man forced by competition to employ his wits to better his neighbor. Unhappily, it's a fiction. So there was this sense, you don't see it so much in these quotes. Clearly there was a sense that small business, new business, anything we might think of entrepreneurship was getting eradicated. Um, the, the implications were policy in terms of uh, public policy was unless there was intervention either in terms of regulation, ownership or competition policy, there would be a demise of democracy. It, nobody really paid attention. The US uh, Congress enacted the Small Business Administration before I was born. When you read the legislation back then, it was per preservationist. It was as if they were protecting an endangered species to uh, counsel, assist, and protect the interests of small business concerns. They were worried that small business would get eradicated if the market was less left to itself. Well, this turns around in um, uh, by the mid 70s. And I'm not gonna talk about the reasons why, but measures show small business, rather than get eradicated, it starts to thrive. Um, studies, a famous one by, they say, call him the father of entrepreneurship, observes 1981, four out of five jobs are created by small firms. Studies throughout Europe, I don't know if they'd argue with them and say, no, it's not four out of five, it's five out of six or three out of four, but they were finding Somehow smallness was driving uh, the president of the EU, Romano Prodi, around the turn of the century, he echoed the, um, the uh, Lisbon Council of Europe and in, 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 in emphasizing that what Europe needs is to become a leader in knowledge to drive growth, but also in entrepreneurship. And so there was this clear acknowledgement now, not that that entrepreneurship was being eradicated, but that actually it was thriving and it was the key to economic performance. Um, this also kind of corresponds, yeah, there's Fukuyama's uh, famous book, to what you might think now looking back to the, the golden age of democracy, 
which kind of starts maybe after, after the fall of the Berlin Wall and Fukuyama characterized it as the end of history. Nobody questioned the permanence, the pervasiveness of democracy. It was just a matter of time till developing countries going up the arc of economic development. It was just a matter of time till that democracy diffused to them. <clears throat> and um, until we, we get to, I would say now our contemporary era that starts maybe even 20 years ago. This is just an example of a, a recent book, um, uh, which is kind of more of a best-selling book, The Myth of Capitalism. But you know, we all know the story in here. The, the um, uh, European Union just undertook competition policies against some of the big tech uh, giants in Europe. The United States is undertaking antitrust cases against Google, Amazon, Microsoft, that this, uh, this sense of, of, uh, of uh, and then, then we get to the measurement of entrepreneurship, at all, which is, seems to be disappearing. Um, so that entrepreneurship is, seems to be on decline and the economy seems to be concentrated. This is taken from The Economist, uh, again, before the pandemic and, long, and before this election, it was uh, after the 2016 election. For the United States, we can see, um, this is from a study in the Census Bureau, um, uh, we can see the entry rates and the exit rates are declining in the US over time, which is both indicators of entrepreneurship. Fewer firms are being started, fewer firms are entering, fewer firms are exiting. So we're getting more, uh, it sounds kind of good at first, well, there's fewer failures, but that means there's more stagnation, there's less dynamism. In terms of the Herfindel Index, they, they uh, uh, report a MBR study and finds out that the uh, it, Herfindel Index measured various ways in the United States has been increasing. Um, so that there's a plethora of different studies for the US and for other countries as well. I'll just report a few results here to try to, I don't know, it. it I don't know if it convinced us, but it's certainly striking that uh, uh, a lot of measures for entrepreneurship make it appear that it's in decline, whether it's the ratio of new firms to existing firms, um, that's been declining for some 30 years. The share of entrepreneurs in the working population, that's been declining from about 8% in 1985 to under 4% uh, more recently share of young firms less than five years old, that's been declining uh, by 50% about from the 1980s to now. The share of young firms providing employment, that is the share of jobs accounted for in, in young for new firms, because that's a key measure, new and young of entrepreneurship, that's been declining over time. And meanwhile, the share of employment with, with of larger firms has been increasing, not surprisingly, uh, uh, over time as well. Um, so this is a, a study done by um, um, Ben, uh, not Ben, um, Ben, not not Ben, Ben Vendors. That's somebody else. That's a film director. Um, ben uh, Naudi, Naudi, he did this, and it's from the um, basically it's a how it's the OECD countries. He doesn't have all the OECD countries in this study. It's published, and we can see the entrepreneurship rate, which is essentially either the business ownership rate or the self-employment rate in the um, uh, OECD countries with some left out uh, has been declining consistently over time. So we've seen this decline in democracy over this same period. We've seen this decline in entrepreneurship. Here's the, uh, a, a different study by the OECD that shows entrepreneurship rates. Both the, so I showed you this for the United States. We see the same thing for the OECD countries. Um, this study just came out. The exit rate's been declining, the entry rate, then what they call the job reallocation, which is how many jobs are getting reallocated from one firm to another, that's been declining. It suggests a kind of a stagnation. All this is before the COVID and before the recent elections. Here's the aging of the OECD SMEs. Uh, the base year varies a little bit by a year or two from country to country. This study by Calvino, uh, uh, Chris Gola, and, and Verla. Uh, uh, 
but um, from the base year, and then the diamond is the, uh, I think it's 2019. And we can see in all of these OECD countries, the, 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 the SMEs are getting older and older. Um, so then we come to <coughs> the uh, contemporary um, uh, COVID pandemic. And the, the, I guess our sense is this is only going to entrench both of these tendencies, the tendencies to suppress democracy because of the urgency of to find solutions. In fact, one study that's already published um, and we cite it in the paper uh, finds, and this was back in, in March or April, right after the pandemic started, that the, the, the countries that score higher on the democracy index, they uh, uh, have higher rates of uh, uh, infection, higher incidence of COVID and higher death rates. It seems to be the totalitarian regimes are able to respond uh, more forcefully and more vigorously than the democratic countries for reasons of, um, of uh, uh, the paper doesn't quite get into it, but it seems that the decision-making under democracy is slow and it's difficult to reach a consensus and it's difficult to implement uh, unpopular um, policies. And this tends to make the authoritarian regimes more effective at dealing with the pandemic, but the democracies tend to become more authoritarian as a way of dealing with the pandemic. So the, the, the suppression of democracy tends to be growing or the threat to democracy. And at the same time, uh, we know that a lot of the policies, I mean, we describe this to some degree. Of course, every country has different policies, but the tendency is to entrench the status quo, the large existing organizations that can lobby for favorable uh, policies that are gonna help preserve them and help maintain the status quo where the smaller firms and organizations don't have the same pers per political persuasion. And as a result, they're, they're, they're suffering, suffering from an existential crisis. It tends to be the large employers, the large firms that get, uh, get the uh, policy assistance. So it, it looks like the COVID-19 pandemic is as exasperating a tendency that we've been seeing for 15, 20 years maybe, which is the suppression of democracy and a, 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 a dwindling of entrepreneurial forces. So let me conclude by saying, you know, under no way do, do I or Pedro want to say, oh, we think we know the causality. I mean, we're really observing a correlation in a way between what seems like a decline in democracy um, in the last, not just in the last 20 years, but when we look at these historical examples, we see, oh yeah, they also seem to move together as well. And it seems like uh, uh, most studies are pointing to not just a short term, but a pervasive decline in entrepreneurship that's been going on for decades. Uh, is that worrisome or bothersome? A lot of economists say no, at least to the second and say, no, this is the market solution. I think that's where we get more concerned because it looks like, um, and the reasons for thinking that has to do with the what drives entrepreneurship, which is the uh, ability to identify and create opportunities and act on those opportunities. That uh, uh, a prerequisite is independence of thinking, independence of, of action autonomy of thinking, autonomy of action. As that uh, uh, disappears or is, is suppressed uh, or, or, or is less pervasive, uh, that's less conducive to democracy as well. That's really the thinking. But you know, we surely have no causality. We'll leave that to the, to the younger uh, econometricians. Uh, but it does seem that a paucity a lack, a decline of entrepreneurship is uh, conducive to the erosion of democracy uh, in ways I could talk about maybe more in the discussion. And therefore, the decline of entrepreneurship ought to be a concern for democracy. This is only exasperated, uh, a worrisome situation is now just exasperated. It's throwing oil onto the fire in the COVID 
pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, David. This was a very thought-provoking uh, uh, talk with a very uh, strong historical uh, perspective uh, and with a number of facts which uh, were, quite, uh, were quite new to me, I have to to admit, uh, I, I uh, also worked on, on entrepreneurship some time ago, but that we have also uh, a strong correlation uh, with the current uh, uh, trends uh, uh, with respect to entrepreneurship. This is indeed uh, interesting academically, but also very worrisome. Now, uh, I think it, it has been observed before that, uh, let's say, what we, what we have now and what, what some people are upset about, many of us, at least many of us here, uh, is uh, that it has already started some time before. Yes, I mean, if, if, you, if you listen to talks on populism, on populism, populism is not something which, which Donald, Donald Trump has invented or something like that. So it's, it's, uh, Trump is just, like COVID, like other things, I mean, it's just uh, a historical um, e e event now. And we have to find out as scientists what kind of uh, story is behind that. I mean, causality is one thing, yes. Um, uh, and and uh, the issue is is what? I mean, the question, uh, one, one, one issue was which, which is debated around populism is the issue, uh, um, have the elite made things uh, too complicated. Yes, have we expected too much from the general population? Has things become too complex? And ha we have failed to explain people what goes on. I mean, that's one of the populism story, yes. Uh, uh, now, how does this relate to, uh, David, to your, uh, to, your, to your correlation and how does it bring, bring us, uh, this all to COVID? Um, Really, it, I mean, is COVID maybe see see? I mean, this is so to speak an additional adding up. Yes, but have, has totalitarianism and ignorance of science has this? I mean, take Trump and say, well, I ignore science and I have lots of COVID cases. Yes, I mean, uh, is this causal in this, this direction, or how, how would you see it? I boy, Klaus, uh, lots of things change, but one thing doesn't change, Klaus continues to ask thoughtful, penetrating questions. That's really great. And um, you know, your first point, which is, you know, maybe Trump didn't really invent this, reminds me of, uh, of uh, what uh, Mark Twain, the author wrote one time, sex was invented when I turned 14. Well, populism was invented when Trump, yeah, saw this opportunity. But, you know, the real point of your question is, what about the, uh, 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 has, have the elites, or in a way, the status quo, have we made uh, access to knowledge, understanding, too diffuse, too complex? And, you know, there, when you say that, Klaus, I think, uh, if that's true, then you're to blame, and probably most of the colleagues here, and I'm to blame. Because if you think about our field, say economics, you know, have we a have we focused on the right things, or have we been distracted by increased nuances, complexities that seem too inaccessible, so that and 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 therefore just end up rejecting? Uh, there may be a um, a uh, 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 and I think that's part of the uh, what drives both democracy and entrepreneurship. Uh, the, the lack of participation, well, at least until this election of democracy and the lack of the feeling of, of uh, alienation people have is it seems too complicated. It seems too far away, removed and distant. And I would say even entrepreneurship, this is surprising and it's impressionistic, um, but from me, but that's the most interesting, you know, um, back in the, um, during the golden age of democracy, which does correspond or correlate to the golden age of entrepreneurship. Uh, and to, you know, we know the kind of um, uh, myths that went on that anybody could go out to the garage and start a company and next thing they, they had Apple. And this wasn't something that was unattainable. Now what we find from young people is that entrepreneurship seems to be more and more something about Silicon Valley. It's something required venture capital, complex finance, 
complex. Uh, uh, it's beyond people. I think we've actually made both democracy and entrepreneurship beyond the grasp of uh, uh, of uh, uh, of every man of of, of the, the regular person. I think though your insight is that in the end we have ourselves to blame as researchers, thought leaders, and people at universities. The way we're, we're the way we're the questions we're asking, the what the ideas we're valuing, the way we're communicating is um, uh, uh, is 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 not conducive to participation, democracy, to reaching reaching uh, uh, Yederman, right? Every man. Well, we have to realize that while we think democracy is so important and entrepreneurship is so important and competition is so important, most people, if you go and ask people on the street, uh, probably will say, well, at the end, it's not so important. Health is more important at the moment. For instance, for instance dominating everything, it's a strong man become uh, popular. Uh, we see this everywhere in the world, in all democracies. Well, it, in, in my country, right, what, so, was it 70, 70 million people basically voted that, right? I think it's 70 million. Exactly, exactly. And the most popular person in Germany at the moment is the prime minister of Bavaria, who has shown strengths and strong uh, strong positions in the debate. Okay, now, I, I don't want to monopolize uh, this discussion because we have uh, at least one important question from the audience. If you look in the question and answer box, I can read it to you. Uh, there's an alternative, a competitor to explain what's, what's going on. The, the colleague, uh, Mindy Schoss, uh, ask, asks, uh, what, to what extent are the declines of uh, democracy and entrepreneurship both driven by a poor social safety net and, and more to that? So what do you think about that? I think that's a great... Um, you know, this wouldn't really say, I, first of all, his kind of premise that says there's something deeper that would be driving either one or both of these. I mean, what the young people call structural models, I'm not gonna touch. I mean, I'm not gonna accuse Klaus or drag him in, but we come from the age of correlation. <laughs> Klaus, that's, you know, it's in, in, in think, but I think that's, I think the question, yeah, there's clearly underlying what is it dr that's driving this, and I think that's correct. I think the lack of a social safety net. We know. But by the way, that takes us back to my second context, at least the um, the 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 populist movement in the United States, as these small businesses and farms in rural America uh, uh, went bankrupt and failed. The, there was no social safety net other than the family and perhaps the community, but as the entire families got wiped down in communities, uh, there's, there's wonderful literature written about this era. These people had to flee to the big cities and then get jobs, really dismal jobs in the meatpacking industry or in the oil refining business or something. There was no social safety net then. You know, you could argue in that golden era of democracy saw an, uh, 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 an expansion of the social safety net or at least uh, uh, had a high, but it's clear that the decline of the social safety net in most Western countries also correlates with the same time period where we see the decline in democracy and entrepreneurship. So that's, I think that, and there's a lot of, I mean, I feel more comfortable uh, talking about the entrepreneurship uh, because I've, we've seen research on that, that the freedom, you know, everybody says risk inhibits entrepreneurship, but we know a social safety net will decrease the perceived risks associated with the entrepreneurial decision. And so most people don't think about it, but a social safety net in that sense is conducive to entrepreneurship. And so I agree with Charles that this is probably a, um, uh, you know, what exactly the causality is, as I say, is beyond me. But I think that's a, a, a good place to look for the decline in the social safety net. And most people, I think, traditionally have felt like the social safety net inhibits entrepreneurship, but actually it probably is conducive to entrepreneurship because it decreases the risk. Okay, now we have um, our friend Wunawa from Middlebury uh, who raised his hand to ask a question. Can we allow him to ask a question? 
I've known him even longer than you. Absolutely not. No, please do. So can we, how can yeah, we get him? Wait, mute. do I have to do, do I have to do something? Oh, there okay, he is. Are you, are you able to hear me now? Yeah, I yes. can hear you. Oh, okay, so when you go back and one of the charts you are showing about uh, during the Nazi Germany, whatever the, you, you showed from whatever, if I'm not mistaken, from early 30s to 40s, there was a real decline in the number of new firms, right? Am I correct, if I remember correctly? That's well, correct. I, I, yeah, but when you look at it, one of the questions I have is, is it conceivable that there may be a lot of small firms which might have started, you know what I mean? Because when I'm looking at the firm, what are we talking about? Are we talking about every firm? Are you talking about only those firms which were registered? Because my understanding is if you have a, a threshold level of employment, maybe you're required to register. But if, what if the employment levels are, I mean, the firm size is very small. Uh, is it conceivable that those those things might have missed out? Yes. You know what? It's it's like votes in Georgia. It's conceivable that okay. couples slipped in under um, or votes in Pennsylvania. It's a really good question, Pani, because what we have are, are firms that were registered um, by the um, at the Handelskammer, which is what's a Handelskammer, Klaus? The um, local firm organization, organization yeah. of administrating or coordinating uh, their activities in the region, you know, like education and, and so on. And, you know, I would leave it as a, a great research question for economic historians. Uh, you know, what, what I didn't go through, uh, which was a smart decision, because I think we know this, is that after um, World War II, in the um, Eastern and Central European countries, we saw even more pronounced the er eradication of small business and really a, they called them um, uh, combinat, combines. Uh, so East Germany famously had, I think I memorized the number, 227 combines and, and that was it. Now, there were informal small businesses kind of underground things going on. It gets into how something, it's a very good question. You know, I think the, you could you could probably make a claim and find examples of small businesses that were certainly operating underground and certainly uh, operating, but we only have the official statistics, and that would be a good a good research question. I mean, maybe it's not true. Maybe that's actually not true, and you know, it'd be an interesting hypo, you know research question to really probe was there was there business going on certainly underground illegally there was that's for sure. Yeah, so, so I have a, it's a little bit of a follow-up question, if I may ask you a little bit about when you showed the employment, whatever was much more generated in a, a small or medium-sized firms, whatever may be the case. Is it conceivable that the flip side of that is uh, because uh, large firms really didn't want to start because of labor unions? Because uh, as you know, that whenever you, you wanted to start on something on a large scale, it, it could be a, a potential target for unions to get in. And uh, so maybe because we always talk about this union threat effects, uh, saying that uh, maybe the firms really don't want to go, you know what I mean? Don't want to go beyond a threshold size so that so that they can keep the unions out of the workspace. It's a good uh, hypothesis, you know, it's, and, and I, I do recall in the literature uh, of an earlier era, uh, they would say that um, uh, the, the barriers posed by organized labor uh, uh, was a barrier to entry of, of firms, or at least firm, firms becoming uh, sufficiently large. And it, it really impeded the entry of firms. So I think your hypothesis, I think that's a reason why. In a little bit, it's like Charles's question probing, well, what was driving those changes in, um, in the, the firm size distribution of those, of those periods? Um, uh, and the, I think the answer is a lot of things. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of it's institutional, as you said, organized labor mm -hmm. made it more difficult for firms to start. Uh, but we saw actually, when you read the historians, there's a whole plethora of rules and regulations that go along with that, that were, uh, you know, now we, we kind of uh, uh, suppress or truncate all that and call that um, uh, ease of entry ease of yeah. entry, you see this in the World Bank <clears throat> database and so on. 
but these are the different factors going on. I think you're right to say that's that's a that's a key one. Okay, David, there are two more, I have to interrupt here, there are two more questions I would like to get through here um, during, for the, in, within the next two or three minutes, so to speak. So there are, uh, David, if you can look uh, at, at the Zoom webinar chat, uh, then you see the questions which are longer, but I can read them to you. The first question is, uh, is, this, is, uh, is the situation in Poland like in, in Hungary in terms of democracy? Uh, that was one question. And the other question is, is today's entrepreneurship really a candidate to save democracy? Do we not need uh, an alternative entrepreneurship role uh, model? And there's a more deeper uh, explanation for the question. Yes, I like that second question a lot because that's actually one of the implications is that the way we think about what entrepreneurship is it depends on the problem. I've seen this in my career. I've seen that what we think entrepreneurship is, it, it evolves over time. And um, back when the problem in the 1980s was rampant unemployment, unemployment rates of double digit, uh, up, going towards 20% in Europe and Canada, North America, Australia. Uh, uh, it was this guy, David Birch, who said, well, jobs may be uh, uh, disappearing, but one, some, one part is, is creating jobs, small business. And at that point, entrepreneurship in small business seemed to be synonymous. People actually didn't talk about entrepreneurship, but the point was it seemed to deliver what society needed was jobs. As we, after the wall fell and as there was more global competition, innovation became as clear. That was the constraint, the competitiveness problem. Again, what the people started to think about entrepreneurship is it delivers innovation and it got more connected to entrepreneurship. More recently, we've seen it connected as Prodi did to growth as there was kind of a growth crisis in countries uh, and in the developed countries or to productivity. And then even more recent to social inclusion, the inclusion of marginalized uh, groups so that it's an elusive concept. Now, what that means in the question says, if the problem or if we, we're concerned about democracy, then what we think constitutes entrepreneurship might be a little bit different than the Silicon Valley model of entrepreneurship, which is real good at getting, giving us um, you know, um, uh, disruptive innovation, radical innovation, uh, venture capital fueled startups, uh, scale up growth, and then a exit strategy um, uh, everything that goes along with that model. I'm not against it, but um, there's other kinds of ways to think about uh, entrepreneurship. Some people are a fan, for example, of the Mittelstand in Germany. That's almost the opposite of, of Silicon Valley. The companies are old. They tend to be family old, owned. They don't have exit strategies. They have family succession. They tend to be in manufacturing. Uh, they tend to be embedded in their communities. And um, they tend to look for uh, global niches for their products. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, I could appeal to Klaus to tell you, what does that word Mittelstand really means? And even the Germans forget, uh, I know better, of course, it means middle class. And so these firms, it's more than just they're small. They actually embody a, a certain uh, spirit, a certain set of values that drives the middle class and that seems to be connected to democracy. I'm only saying that in conjecture uh, uh, or uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, to, to the question that says, it, yeah, will, will our understanding of what is entrepreneurship, will that evolve as we start to think about, yeah, democracy is actually something that's gotta be addressed rather than as Klaus and I were young. I mean, it was assumed. It just, nobody ever would have even asked this question because democracy wasn't a problem. It was just ubiquitous every place. But as that becomes important, the reason for thinking about why do we have the kind of organization of, of labor that we have in large scale, small scale, uh, the ease of, as Pani was saying, the ease of starting, all this may have implications for uh, political and social democracy. Is family entrepreneurship also in decline? Is entrepreneurship on decline? Family entrepreneurship also in decline? 
does I don't know if anybody here knows that answer. I don't because I haven't seen the measures. Uh, partly, it's hard to measure it across countries because different countries. That's one of the things that you learn from doing a, a, a paper like this is that we only start measuring something when we think it's important. Because why would society or anybody put in invest money resources to measure something? And so. Um, uh, uh, people haven't really been worried about this being in decline at all. So we lack the, the measurement in any systematic uh, way. I mean, I think one answer is it seems to be varied. And in some countries, some regions, some industries, it's clearly in decline and, and less so in others. But my sense would be, you know what? That's subsumed in these measures of small business. I, my guess is Klaus, yes, but again, somebody needs to do that research and measurement. Well, at the moment in Germany, we have the problems that many, many firms are run by older uh, mm. family entrepreneurs and they have uh, no sons and daughters who want to take on the business and that, then there is a crisis. But, okay, no, but uh, family entrepreneurs typically are called, uh, are thought to be, uh, to have a very long-term uh, uh, perspective, and, uh, so to speak, not, not affected by, by simple trends, less like populism or uh, COVID or things like that. That was a I think okay. I, if, if there's an urgent question, uh, ah. well, we can we can hear it, but we should, I think, come to an end because we have passed our time budget. If I see nobody, then thank you very much, first uh, David for this marvelous talk and the, the, the discussion and of course uh, to all the large number of participants around the globe uh, fascinated by this uh, challenge we have. Thank you. See you soon thank at you. another place. Hey, thank you, Klaus. Thank you, Mehmet. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Klaus, for joining uh, us and for your great contribution and support to our society. Uh, as I said, uh, this is the first uh, event for MS members. Actually, this, uh, I think the second event with the MS and GILO uh, joint event, but the, the first event for MS members. And I hope uh, we will have uh, like a series, an event series with GILO for GILO members and MS members. Thank you again, David, Klaus, and all uh, members, all audience for joining us today. And I uh, hope to see you. Uh, I hope all will be fine soon and we will meet again face to face soon. Hopefully. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, so thank you very much for the effective support behind the scenes. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. It's great seeing you, Klaus. Have a good day.